so I guess two directions we could go. So the first one is, what does a technical program manager do exactly? Because, I mean, there's it seems like it means a lot of different things at different organizations, to steal your words from before. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, um, I think a lot of people think of program managers without the technical bit as these guys who maintain schedules, right? You have your scrum board and your moving stories around and you got tickets and all that. Um, but the technical aspect I think is a really important component of what I do. So my background is in aerospace engineering and robotics, right? And so I know the systems I'm working and my responsibility is a lot more than managing a schedule, right? A lot of what I do is making sure that people are talking to each other, making sure that people can interface properly, making sure that people actually um, aren't doing the same thing multiple times. So a great example we always go to is at one point when I was at Argo, we had six different versions of a circular ring buffer for, for the memory of, you know, how, how do you actually access the memory? There were six different ways you could do it. And I was like, well, we probably only need one, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we should pick the best one and, you know, let's, let's everyone convert to that. And, you know, right. Um, so it's finding a lot of things where it's like, Hey, you're doing, you're doing what that guy's doing. Why don't you guys collaborate? And why don't we try to try to minimize the, uh, the, the duplication of effort. That's cool. So it sounds like there's maybe some overlap with like systems engineering a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was actually a systems engineer in, at uh, at Carnegie Robotics, right? Um, there's there's a lot of overlap with the position. It's a little bit different in that systems engineering is usually focused around uh, the product requirements, right? What do we actually need to do to make the product succeed? Uh, whereas the technical program manager, we're much more make the product. A reality make it actually execute but we serve as an interface between your product team that's kind of working with the customer what do you actually want to deliver your systems team that's writing the requirements for the engineers this is how we know we've succeeded and then the technical program manager makes it all come together on schedule that's awesome yeah yeah no it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun you get access to so much of the system you really get to see what's going on and you have a great bird's eye view and uh and you learn a lot. Like I have no background in software development, none whatsoever. I'm a mechanical guy, control systems, but uh, here I am working with machine learning and overseeing a lot of software teams and software development. And you yeah. know, well, don't it have to write like code. The, the buffer you mentioned it was a data structure too. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so you know. Um, if you ask me how to actually write that, I have no idea. I, <laughs> like, I code a little bit of MATLAB, a little bit of Python, but like I have no idea how C++ works or CUDA or TensorRT or any of that stuff you use for machine learning training. But setting up the system, what's required to get the data from the system, things like that, that's, that's, that's kind of my bread and butter of like, okay, how do we make this actually work? How do we build it? How do we turn it into a product? That's awesome. So what are some of the projects you kind of cut your teeth on like early on in your career that made you want to go that direction? Um, I was always interested in robotics, but I kind of got sidetracked in college into the aerospace world, and uh, that led to my time in the Air Force. So a lot of what I did in the Air Force, my first assignment was in a uh, research and development group, um, oh, cool. and we actually did the first SpaceX launch, uh, SMC-XR. We were responsible for the first launch of SpaceX. That would have been like the single... Um engine rocket that they had on that island. Yep, on Kwajalein. Blew up three times. <laughs> nice. uh, yeah, That's yeah. That's what you want. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, I remember very distinctly we were watching that first launch and, uh, you know, we were in the conference room and the engine lit up with like, you know, five seconds left in the countdown and then with one second left they like turned it off and something went wrong. We're like, or are they going to try again, right? It's supposed to be reusable, right? Like, light that candle again if they fix it. And they did. And, you know, kudos to them for trying that. Um, you know, uh, at the time, right, the idea of reusing a rocket engine without massive amounts of tests and, like, verifying that it was, you know, still up to snuff and everything, the Air Force didn't do that. But the oh, beauty of cool. the project and what we did in my organization was, no, we're specifically supposed to take those chances and push that technology to where it needs to go. Yeah, and if it's that isolated, I mean, what's the harm in doing that? Yeah, yeah, Kwajalein is uh, an interesting place. We uh, we tend to, uh, it's, it's it's where uh, when we test uh, that our ICBMs still function, it's where we test that they the warheads <laughs> still hit on target. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they're they're inactive warheads. Everyone always asks, we we detonate nuclear bombs? No, they're that's just you know, the guidance system. That's all we're testing. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun to be honest. Um, so at, at 
Carnegie, then, you got to work on the Nilfisk scrubber. Um. Yeah, yeah. So after I left the Air Force, I went to grad school and uh, ended up over at Carnegie Robotics. Uh, and I was the program manager for, for the Nilfisk SC50 scrubber, uh, which is a great little system. It's one of the first, I think, slam-capable, mass-produced commercial products out there. Um, and so super proud of it. It's, it's one of the only things in my career that I can actually go somewhere and see it in operation. We've got four of them here at the Pittsburgh airport uh, nice. that you can see uh, cleaning, cleaning the airport. And I think the Penguins have some at the stadium. So That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was a really cool project. I feel like it wouldn't be a far cry to put that on the Zamboni. <clears throat> you know, I actually talked to Brian Beyer about doing the Zamboni project, and he <laughs> said they had tried it, but someone had sn snuck in and uh, taken it from them, and so they were just waiting for, for them to come to their senses and come back to Carnegie. So. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so you guys got outbid. <clears throat> yeah, I guess so. I mean, it was before I joined the project. I took over for a uh, previous program manager, so I, I took over about halfway, eh, three-quarters of the way through the project. Yeah, that makes sense. Been there. I mean, for, I guess, a competitive product, uh, Discover Robotics, I think I can talk about this now because they no longer exist. We we bid them for some work on, on some of their software systems, and we got underbid by an offshore company <coughs> by quite a big amount. And last I checked in, they overran our budget. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we bid honestly. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, uh, you know. They it, do. It's always it's always a challenge with these R and D projects, right? Like, um, you know, that that project, especially uh, when I took it over, it was a firm fixed price project. Which, when you're doing R and D, man, that's that's a rough one. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's scary. Yeah, sometimes you come out on top with those, but I mean, my experience has been for R and D. Like, I always want to go T and M these days, just because I've been burned too many times on firm fixed. Yeah, yeah, uh, but I think the real challenge in that situation, and what made it uh, kind of a unique project, um, is the customer is uh, Nilfisk has been a lot around for a long time, like 120 years. Uh, they're known as Advance, I guess, in the U.S., but they're a Danish company, and. Um, you know, this was really kind of pushing the envelope for them, right? Like they knew how to make cleaning products and that's what they did. Um, and so we leveraged that, that, that experience, right? What did we know about making cleaning products? We knew how to build robots at Carnegie, um, but they weren't really used to like, oh, there's, there's unpredictability here, right? Like an engine is an engine, right? The, I think at the time we were working on the project, the most advanced software they had on any of their system was 6,000 lines of code. <laughs> we were in the like millions, right? Yeah, like, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so you know, it was a real adjustment to them, um, and uh, and you know, I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, at one point, right, kind of the 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 senior manager. So I had my counterpart at Nilfisk, and his new boss came from Denmark to kind of oversee the project and what we're doing and everything. And you know, I wanted to sit down with the guy and give him a good impression of what's going on and all that. And I was like, you know. Uh, I, I really want to commend you on Nilfic's forward-thinking vision, right? Because at the time, right, like, no one really mass-produced robots, right? Like, okay, you had, like, iRobot that's making your little home Roombas, and they'd make, like, the Talons and, like, the military robots. But, you know, how many of those do they make a year, right? Like, you're making a couple hundred of the talents, yeah. Of the talents, yeah. I robot, yeah. Sure, millions, sure. But yeah. you're we're talking a different scale, right? Like uh, anyone yeah. who's thinking I'm talking about like a little Roomba thing. No, this this thing weighs fifteen hundred pounds and like cleans <laughs> warehouses, right? Yeah. Um, and so you know, I'm talking to the to the manager, and I'm like, you know, at this point next year when we release the product, Nilfisk will be one of the largest manufacturers of autonomous robots in the world. And like he was like, huh? And I was like, okay. Well, he took that kind of weird all right <laughs> i don't know what happened right and then uh you know i'm off doing some work and the, my counterpart comes over he's like what did you say to him and i'm like well no i said you know nilfus great you're being this forward-thinking amazing company and he was like well he thinks this is some sort of r&d project it's like well I mean, it is, right? <laughs> I mean, do you see cleaning robots? You know, uh, the system's really advanced. It uses full slam. Like, you know, you, you, you tell it where it is and like, you know, um, it, it remembers the map. It'll duplicate exactly what you did every time or it can auto fill in what you're doing. And like people underestimate, right? Like how how much is still left in these systems, right? Like it was nothing wrong with what he was saying. It just... 
everyone thinks, oh, robots are right around the corner, right? Like yeah, yeah. Uh, artificial intelligence, it's right around the corner. We've got all these amazing things. Look at our phones. ChatGPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. ChatGPT. It. It'll solve all <laughs> your problems, right? Like, um, but like, there's a reason these things are university experiments or like startups, right? Like, this isn't getting a commercial robotic product. How many of those exist even today? You know, we're we're seven years since I worked on that, something like that, six years, right? Yeah. How many commercial products that have autonomy and 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 slam and like advanced artificial intelligence really exist? Arguably, like the John Deere tractors, the Tesla cars, yeah, to some extent, uh, yeah, yeah, and some of their competitors. Well, now. I mean, iRobot now has it right. They got the upwards facing camera on the Roomba, and it'll map your ceiling and stuff like that. Like yeah. it exists. It is starting to get there. But like, is that how they're doing it? Is they have an upwards facing camera? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got a little, they've got a little camera that looks up and it makes a map of your ceiling. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, if you move your table around, it'll mess with it a bunch. Um, <laughs> I don't know. They may have. They may. You know, I, I don't know their software, but I know they have the camera. They may be using their little uh, wall followers to do like a two D. 2D point cloud. Map well, they've been or doing slam for a while now with that too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this was all kind of coming into play at yeah. around the same time, and I think that's that's one of the things, you know, with with a lot of these technologies, everyone starts to commercialize it at the same time, but um, but it's a process and it's it's work. It's not like taking something from a really cool demo that like, you know, the DARPA the DARPA Grand Challenge. Right, that was in 2004. They had cars driving across the desert and in on roads for hundreds of 50 miles and all that. Well, where are driverless cars today? They are far more advanced, way more advanced. They can do a heck of a lot more, but the real challenge is in building the commercial product. Yeah. Right, I can do a, I can do a demo that's hey, if I do it perfect, it'll be great. But doing something that like is repeatable and that my mom can use, that's a real challenge. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Part of again, Nilfisk did a great job, really brilliant. One of the things they did is there is a um, IEC standard for floor scrubbers, right? Safety of floor scrubbers. Well, they worked and they created a working group, and I was a member of the working group to build an addendum for autonomous floor oh, cool. scrubbers. And so we developed the safety standard and how you do safety tests and how do you safety certify this floor scrubber. And again, part of it was, well, I'm using parts that, like, it's not a safety-rated part. How do I add the, like, redundancies and everything you need to reach the uh, safety integrity level of, uh, I believe we went to SIL 2, SIL 3? I don't remember what, which level uh, we certified it to. I'm sure it's on their website. Sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, right, so, so first off, you know, you're in a new environment. You're kind of educating these people who don't know much about robotics of how we're building a safety system. And then you've got to understand how you're taking your system and you're, you're making it safe. And then you work with the vendor as much as you can. But at a certain point, you've got you've to you've kind of do it yourself. And that's that's risky. Is that like a lot of testing? Is it just systems engineering improving <clears throat> out, you know, certain paths or it's a little bit of both, right? So one of the big problems we had with the cliff sensors was actually black floors. So uh, one of the key places that they wanted to test this thing was this mall in Switzerland that had these beautiful black marble <laughs> floors. Nice. Um, and so anyone who has worked with LIDAR or lasers will tell you the worst possible thing to image is reflective black surfaces because yep. the black is going to absorb all your laser light and then the reflection will just scatter what's left everywhere and you get no returns on it <laughs> uh, so we had to find right like something powerful enough that you would get a return off these black shiny floors does it still have to be human eye safe though at that and, point yeah it has yeah. to be human eye safe and like <clears throat> yeah yeah it, it was a real challenge and so um you know, me and uh, me and my uh, my my direct report, my partner in crime. She she had a background in photography. I had done some background. I have a bit of a background in theater, and I do like the different shades of black. And so what we did is we literally went out to like Michaels and bought just tons of different black cloths, black paints, and we rigged up like a little light detector kit, and we just measured each of them till we found the least reflective thing we could find 
and then that was our target, right? And that's, right. you know, that's that's how we're going to find the sensor. And then we'd get some samples and like, all right, let's see what we can do. And we'd call up the vendor and, hey, I need like your best laser. And eventually we found a guy and, you know, he was like, yeah, this sucker, I've never seen it fail. And like, it still worked, but like we were pushing the envelope. He's like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, that's amazing. You, you almost got me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, it was, it was a real experience, right? Like a little bit of, uh, you know, and and this is where the T and the TPM to go back to what we were originally talking about, right? Like I was getting my hands dirty. It was too small a project for me to not be involved. So I'd repair the robot. I did a lot of the testing, right? Like I was physically going out and finding the materials and stuff like that. Um, and part of that is because I have a background in robotics. I understand what we need to do, how the sensors work, software developers. All right. They're making the system and everything. I'm finding what we need to actually keep the project going. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. That's awesome, too. I mean, just being able to go out and find, like, every type of black to try to... Vanta black did not exist at the time. That would have really screwed us, I think. Vanta black? <laughs> oh, the blackest paint alive. What right? is like, that? It, it, is, it is a paint. I believe uh, it's, like, some lab in England or something. It is the darkest paint ever made. Interesting. What it... It has, not, like, carbon so nanotubes in it or something. <laughs> That's wild. After Carnegie, that's kind of how I ended up into the driverless cars, um, working over at Argo AI. Cool. <clears throat> um, and I joined, uh, what, like about a year, year and a half after they, they got started. So enough that I was relatively early, but not one of the initial people there. Yeah. Um, and that was fascinating because, you know, the scale and seeing a company scale was a really new experience as a program manager. So how big were they when you came in versus, I mean, I think so, they were like at 2,000 at the... Yeah, year. at the end it was like about 2,000 people. I think I was employee like 300, something like that. Oh, cool. <clears throat> yeah, so it was it was a huge That's growth. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the things as I kind of went through my career, you know, I started when I went to grad school. Well, my military projects were very, very big, but like subcontractors, right? So I had five different subcontractors, each with their own team of like 70, 50 people, right? But I had no direct supervision or, or, or right? Like I was, I was kind of there to make sure the budget was going and all that. Um, so then I get to grad school and the lab starts off with seven people. And by the time the end of the DRC, we were about 20 people. And I go to Carnegie Robotics, and the team's about 12 people. <clears throat> like, the whole team for the whole project. Um, and then I get to Argo. This on the Nilfus project. Yeah, the Nilfus project. Yeah. And then I get to Argo, and now, whoa, 300 people, like 150 engineers, right? That's got to be some insanity just to try to adapt to that scale. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's something... Um, my, my, my buddy Joe from Virginia Tech, actually, his master's thesis was on this, where... The, the requirements of information transfer as you scale a system require more and more resources, right? And if you undervalue maintaining that oversight and information transfer, your project fails, right? You get too much stove piping or people don't know what they're doing or chaos erupts and there's a tendency you realize something's wrong, and eventually you try to kind of like buy your way out of it. Oh, I'll, I'll hire my way out of it, and it's too late. You've crossed that uh. mythical man month, right? And <laughs> nine women can't make a baby in a month. Yeah, right. So, sense. so, um, so seeing, seeing, you know, I, I had known Joe's thesis, and it was a really fascinating. You know, I'd never thought about things that way, and uh, so going to Argo. It was one of the things that I wanted to try to make sure we avoided and make sure that, like, good information flow, good understanding of what we were doing, and not being overbearing, right? Like, that's you can go too far. You can put too much oversight. Now no one's getting anything done because they're constantly updating their JIRA boards. And, right, like, the government tends to, we want to document everything. We have to know everything. Well, startups want to... I don't want any process, but you can't build a product like that. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and, for sure. And so you have to ride that line of like, how do I get the information to where it needs to go? Make sure people know what they're doing, and uh, and not slow down development. <clears throat> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and uh, 
you know, we were we were pretty successful at it. You know, uh, what are I, some of the mechanisms you use, like? To, to try to keep information transfer where it should be. So, uh, I mean, one of the one, there's a tendency to say, I'm going to roll my own tools, right? Like any sort of program management tool is going to have its flaws. Uh, we use primarily Jira um, by Atlassian, and Jira's good at a lot of things, but it's not perfect, right? Uh, one of the things that I really don't like about it is, and it's gotten a lot better, but at the time, there was no great way for it to interact with Gantt charts. Yeah, I noticed that. Or like <clears throat> setting deadlines and timelines. Right, it, exactly. It is very it's agile. It's kind of purist. Yeah, yeah, it is pure agile. Yeah. Well, that doesn't work with hardware, right? Hardware has lead times. Anytime you're developing hardware, right? Anytime you're machining a part. Yeah. Anytime right. you're waiting for... There's all sorts of... Uh, What's the word? Dependencies. Dependencies. Yeah, exactly. Somebody needs to work on this over here before you can integrate it right, over there. Right, right. Or like, if you don't get this done in time, you've now blocked all this other work behind you, right? Critical path analysis. That sort of thing that is very, very difficult to visualize in Jira. Um, yeah. Pure Jira. Um, so... You know, a lot of what we did was we'd manually kind of lay out the schedules, try to look at long term, um, and then we'd have Jira for like the actual work developers are doing. But uh, a lot of times, you know, you 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 have to. I've got a problem at the moment, and again, I want to resist the urge to like, well, everyone go update everything and everything. All right, I build kind of a here's what I'm doing, and I've just got a punch list of tasks that I need to work through, and just all right, we're doing a daily sync. And, like, I'm going through and I'm making sure that, like, did we hit this? Did we hit this? Did we hit this? Did we hit this? Right? Um, and there's some argument to be made that, like, well, you could do that in Jira. But, yeah, I, but I got to set up the board and I got to make yeah. sure. It, right, right. Like, I spreadsheet, super easy, right? I just make a list, a couple columns, who's reporting, that's it. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> right? So you do that for kind of your, your fast pace. Like, it's changing so often. Everyone can go into the spreadsheet. There's still, no, like, learning the UI or learning the interface. You can do that with, like, a 300-person team? So we did eventually break Google Sheets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. yeah, yeah. 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 So the secret is you have to keep any one component that you're doing that with small enough that you don't, like have too many people causing it to update and synchronize that to... makes sense a lot of times what i'll do with google sheets too is i'll have like sprints or like projected sprints like in this axis <coughs> uh i guess rows for people mm -hmm. listening to audio and then i'll have different functions um as columns and then i'll say like what different functions need to do by what you know time scale in order to you know, achieve a thing and I'll half step, but that's closer to a Gantt chart. Yeah, like yeah. Well, well what, I, what I originally set up was actually a little bit, uh, a quarterly planning template where like, all right, you know, one of the big challenges is, you know, you, you go, you get to quarterly planning and you're like, all right, everyone estimate what we're going to do. And it's like, oh, well, I want to do blah, 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 blah. All right, well, do you have the capacity to do that? Right? <laughs> like, how do you how do you actually know? So I built like a spreadsheet where it's like, okay, list all the things you want, and then here's the weeks in the quarter, and then okay, here's how many, here's the people you got, right? And like assign, you know, the the full time engineers per week, one full time engineer per week, whatever. And then at the bottom, it would add it up, and we'll be like, you got ten engineers, and you just assigned twenty weeks worth of work yeah. in that week. It's just yeah. not going to happen, right? Yeah. Slide it out. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so it, it's... it's uh, it, Or bring in resources. Or bring in resources urgency. depending on urgency. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of it is, again, don't let, don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. Don't let the tool slow you down. Yeah, I think but, we've all been guilty of that every <clears> now and then. Absolutely. But now here's the real thing. Make sure your leadership knows what's going on, right? Like, that's the other aspect of it, right? Reporting up, making sure that, you know, you're, you're providing timely, actionable information, right? So there's a real tendency to have engineers, you know, you ask them to report every week and, like, what, what, what went on. And, you know, they know what they're doing, but they'll use super technical language that's super detailed. Well, what's the impact? How does that affect like the overall timeline, right? Like so that you can boil that up so that you know you can let the CTO, CEO know, all right, you know, we've got 
we've got an issue with our build server. We need to expand capacity, or you know, here's how much you know we're 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 spending on our cloud storage or cloud resources or you know whatever whatever's going on at that time, right? You have to be able to boil that information up to your executives so that they can take the actions that you aren't going to be able to like go go to Amazon and like okay right like give me the best price you know right <laughs> like there's a team for that and how do you divert their resources to what you need thanks for joining us today if you've made it this far chances are you'll like other episodes too collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube Spotify Apple Podcasts Google Podcasts Pocket Casts and Radio Public Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at www.ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you